Hello everyone and welcome to Box Office Receipts. I'm your host Tyler Callahan and we got what I would say is a decent amount of news to talk about. The biggest obviously is Across the Spider-Verse opening the huge numbers. So let's talk about that first. Opening in first place is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse with $120.5 million. In second place was The Little Mermaid with $40.6 million for a total of $186.2 million. Third place was The Boogeyman, which debuted with $12.3 million. And fourth place was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 with $10.2 million for a total of $322.7 million. And in fifth place was Fast X with $9.2 million for a total of $128 million. Point four million. Across the Spider-Verse opened big and a huge win for Sony. This is the third biggest opening for a Spider-Man movie, and as of now, the biggest opening weekend this summer, and it's not surprising why. While the first one performed reasonably well, it didn't do anything huge. However, since then, it won Best Animated Film at the Oscars and has been on Netflix on and off for periods of time. That means over the past three and a half years, more and more people have watched it, especially kids, and have been looking forward to the sequel. On top of that, it helps that the reviews have been excellent and word of mouth is strong as well. We'll have to see if it becomes the big movie of the summer, but right now, at least domestically, it's laying its claim to it. We also have a new horror movie come out with The Boogeyman, which did okay. Considering this was meant to be a straight-to-Hulu movie, it's not doing bad. The budget for the film was around $35 million, so it does have a bit of a hill to climb, but I think it can still make a small profit at the box office. In China, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse Opened in first place with 18 million. Dropping to second place was Fast X with 8 million for a total of 130.6 million dollars. Third place was Castle in the Sky with 6.2 million for a total of 11.2 million. It did open on Thursday. And fourth place was Doryamon Castle in the Sky, which also opened on Thursday and made 4.3 million for a total of 11.4 million. And fifth place was Godspeed with 4 million. For a total of 159.4 million. Looking at international numbers, Spider Man Across the Spider Verse earned 88.1 million for a worldwide opening weekend of 208.6 million. Just for reference, the first film made 375 million worldwide in its entire run. The Little Mermaid made another 42.3 million for a worldwide total of 326.7 million dollars. The Boogeyman earned $7.7 million for a worldwide opening weekend of $20 million. Fast X made $41.4 million for a worldwide total now of $603.3 million. And Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 made $12.4 million for a worldwide total of $780.1 million. Taking a look at news in Hollywood, the SAG Union have voted in favor of authorizing a strike at the end of June if a new deal with the studios has not been reached, and talks between the union and the studios have started this week as well. Unlike the writers' union negotiations, these talks have been agreed to be under a media blackout, so it's unlikely we will hear much until the end of the month, deal or no deal. The DGA's board have voted to approve their new contract with the studios, and now the guild members will vote on it. If approved by the guild, the contract will be finalized, and for the, for the studios, that will be at least one union that does not go on strike. For Warner Brothers, some of the Flash reviews have started to come out, and it is okay. After all the hype of being one of the best superhero movies ever, reviews have just been okay. Now, yes, there are some people saying it is one of the best superhero movies, blah, 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 blah. But looking at the Rotten Tomatoes score, it's hovering between a 60-70% range. That's okay. Now, it's not the reviews the studio were hoping for, especially when they've been doing all these screenings and getting people in Hollywood to say how great it is. So we will see how it does at the box office when it comes out soon. In a exclusive from Deadline, the Warner Animation Group is undergoing a transformation. First, it is being renamed as Warner Brothers Pictures Animation with their new boss, Bill Damansky, who is the president of Feature Animation. As for what is being worked on moving forward, the goal is to have two theatrical land-made films released yearly and work on creating new IP instead of just adapting IP Warner Brothers already has. I think that is a good move in mixing it up as IP becomes more and more important in Hollywood, giving the animation side of the studio a chance to make their own. It can be a positive move overall. During the filming of Gladiator 2 this week, there was an accident during a stunt that left six crew members with burn injuries. 
All of them are not life-threatening, and four of them are still recovering at a local hospital. Hopefully they have a speedy recovery. The Hollywood Reporter is exclusively reporting that Lionsgate is working on a new Leprechaun film. This is a horror franchise from the 90s that did have some newer films come out over the past few years, but those weren't released theatrically. This looks to be more of a reboot than a continuation of the series, which is a smart move and will be directed by Felipe Vargas. There's another horror film in development, this one at A24, called Heretic. The film will be directed by Scott Beck and Brian Woods, and Hugh Grant is looking to play the villain. The directing duo are coming off of writing and directing 65, you know, the Adam Driver movie with dinosaurs. Uh, though Hugh Grant in a horror movie sounds great. In exclusive from Deadline, they are reporting that MGM is setting December 25th as the release date for The Boys in the Boat. This is a movie adaptation of a book with the same name, focused on the U.S. rowing team competing in the 1936 Summer Olympics in Berlin, directed by George Clooney. As for why they are setting a Christmas release date, Deadline reports the studio is really happy with the test scores the film have gotten so far and are looking to get families to come and see it. We will see if that works out for them. For trailers, we got two this week. The first is for Poor Things. The movie is directed by Yorgos Lanthimos and stars Emma Stone, Willem Dafoe, and Mark Ruffalo. It comes out September 8th. Lionsgate released the first trailer for The Expendables 4, and I gotta say, it doesn't look too great. I could be wrong. I could be. But right now, it just does not get me excited to see it. Uh, that comes out September 22nd. We start off with Apple for VOD Premium, where Deadline is exclusively reporting on a new film in development. This one is a collaboration between Apple Original Films and Skydance with the film called Mayday. It will be directed by Jonathan Goldstein and John Francis Daly, with Ryan Reynolds and Kenneth Branagh set to star in it. It's not known right now what the movie would be about. I mean, look, from what the team is right now, it should be a good movie. Should. But you easily could have said that about Ghosted, and look what happened there. Apple has bought a documentary series focused on Lionel Messi and his journey to winning the World Cup. While the series was in development before Argentina won the World Cup last year, uh, the purpose of the series is his journey throughout the years, leading the national team through multiple World Cups. You know, uh, you know, 2000, you know 2010, 2014, uh, you know, 2008. No, it'd be 2006. My bad. 2006. Since they did win last year, you know it's going to have that perfect ending. The series will be in four parts, and right now no word on when it will come out. Also for Apple, their new show, The Crowded Room, starring Tom Holland and Amanda Seinfeld, is getting trashed by critics with it at 30% on Rotten Tomatoes. Disney has finally given a release date to Ahsoka, which was previously set to come out sometime in August. will come out August 23rd. Also, Disney is striking back in India, looking to gain some momentum and getting subscribers with more cricket. While they do not have the Indian Premier League, they will be offering later in the year the Men's World Cup and the Asia Cup for free to stream. To watch for free, users will have to access Disney Plus Hotstar from their mobile device. This is a smart way in getting people to at least take a look at what the service offers, and who knows, maybe some will subscribe because of it. Over at Warner Brothers Discovery, HBO announced that they have canceled Perry Mason after two seasons. It's weird because the first season got some love and was a little popular when it came out, but they then released the second season back in March, and I feel they just kind of pushed it out with no marketing, so no one watched it. I do wonder, though, if that if that is a way for them to cancel it. If you don't push hard marketing, you know, if you don't push hard on the marketing for it, then it gets low viewership because no one knows it came out. You can say it's not worth keeping because no one watched it and then cancel it, but people didn't watch it because you didn't advertise it. I don't know. Could be a crazy conspiracy, but it's just kind of weird how, like, based on how the first season went reception-wise, you know, the look and feel of the show, that could have been a classic HBO show that went on for a few years, and now it's just over. Uh, Variety is reporting that Mark Ruffalo is set to lead a new HBO limited series that focuses on a task force and the criminals they try to catch. The series comes from Brad Inglesbury, who made Meyer of Easttown recently for HBO. Amazon has ordered an Angry Birds animated series for kids called Angry Birds Mystery Island. The first season will be 24 episodes and comes from Eric Rogers and Titmouse. In response to Citadel not catching on domestically, Amazon Studios' head of drama series, Odea Watkins says it needs time to grow and that the U.S. audience is jaded. Quote, I think there are so many chapters to this. I think you'll start to see the audience start to respond differently as it goes on. In the U.S., we are very jaded and watch everything with a discerning eye. Like, hmm, that wasn't as good as the last one. I just think needs time to grow. End quote. This comes from answering a question from Variety at a media panel in Canada. While this show is clearly more built for an international audience than a domestic one, I think Amazon was hoping 
since it had action and was a high-budget show, it would have caught on at this point. But if we are looking at the Nielsen charts, it is yet to do so. I wonder if they will make any changes in the second season to try and capture the domestic audience or just advertise it more. Paramount Plus has announced that the next Taylor Sheridan show, Special Ops Lioness, premieres July 23rd and also released the first trailer for it as well. The cast is headlined by Zoe Saldana and also stars Morgan Freeman, Michael Kelly, and Nicole Kidman. Taking a look at Netflix, The Mother, starring Jennifer Lopez, has made it to the top 10 most watched English films for the streamer. Now with 229.3 million views, it is 8th on the list. On the TV side, FUBAR is doing well, staying in first place on Netflix's weekly chart, with another 88 million hours watched. Also, Manifest jumped back into second place on the TV charts, with Netflix having just released the second half of the fourth and final season, with 39.4 million hours. Variety has learned that production on the upcoming series Zero Day, starring Robert De Niro, has been put on hold due to the writer strike. And finally, while we have no direct info from Netflix yet, it looks like the password crackdown is working in the U.S. by getting people to sign up. Research company Antenna reports that the daily signups for Netflix has averaged 73,000 at the end of May, which is a 102% increase from the 60-day average before the crackdown started. They also noticed during the same period cancellations in the U.S. also went up, but were lower than the number of signups. Again, we will need to wait for the official word from Netflix, likely at their next quarterly earnings, but everything is pointing to at least it being an early success. And that's it for this episode of Buying Salvers Receipts. If you want to follow me on Twitter or Facebook, links to those are in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and see you next time.